Bonjour à tous et merci d'être. Good evening to you all. Thank you for being here for this conference for, by uh, Victoria Sweet and Marofio. Um, I'm from the University of Geneva. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the people, thanks to whom we were able to invite uh, Victoria Sweet, our sponsors. First of all, HUG, uh, through its uh, medical doctor, uh, Dr. Perrier, but also uh, the Foundation for uh, Medical Research, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, no, as well as uh, Alexandra Mondolfia, who has organized everything picture perfect. Now I would like to introduce you to Victoria Sweet. Victoria Sweet is a very particular person. She is a medical doctor, but she's also a historian. Throughout her career, she started reflecting on medicine, which led her to the concept of slow medicine through her personal experience with her patients, through her professional experience in hospital settings, including in a very special hospital in San Francisco, the Laguna Honda Hospital, a hospital that is based on the medieval almshouse notion, yet with access uh, to state-of-the-art technology. And then the hospital that uh, replaced it, uh, based on uh, the modern principles of healthcare. This professional experience led her to challenge this system that is solely based on so-called efficiency. Then she went on to, to do a PhD on uh, a very famous uh, medical practitioner from uh, the 12th century, Hildegard von Bingen, who wrote uh, several texts on the art of healing, and that went to enrich uh, Victoria Sweet's reflection. She continued on her way by going to Santiago de Compostela almost every summer. Uh, she went all the way to Santiago de Compostela, and she therefore began, she became a pioneer in the slow medicine movement, and her message is very clear. In the end, if you take uh, the time that is necessary with the patient to come up with the right diagnosis, you can uh, care for them a lot better and it costs a lot less. It takes, uh, in, by ways of uh, consequence, uh, taking more time ends up costing less. If uh, Victoria Sweet and others want to take time with their patients, we can find the same uh, thing here in Switzerland. And before giving the floor to Victoria Sweet, I would like to give the floor to Arnaud Perrier, medical doctor uh, of the Geneva Hospital, because he has a project around slow medicine, and I would like him to tell you about it. Arnaud, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Anne. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, rest assured, I will be very brief since you are here to listen to Victoria Sweet. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome uh, Victoria Sweet uh, together with uh, the medical faculty of the University of Geneva. Uh, slow medicine, which is a kind of medicine that takes its time, is uh, part of a priority project uh, for, the, for um, the HUG. And this project is called More Time for Patients. Uh, modern time hospitals, as everybody knows, is under pressure, under time pressure on patients, on healthcare professionals. And this pressure is not necessarily due to uh, healthcare tasks. Um, of course, there is all the clinical paperwork uh, that healthcare professionals have to fill out. Uh, nowadays, uh, medical doctors spend a lot of time in front of computer screens and a lot of time in front of their keyboards and not with their patients. In this context, a lot of people end up being frustrated, both healthcare professionals as well as patients. Medicine is uh, the result of an interaction, it's a human encounter, and when you miss that encounter, healthcare professionals suffer from it too. And this is why at uh, HUG we are rethinking our work uh, within our wards. We are doing so together with the people who are working uh, on site, uh, with uh, nursing uh, staff, uh, with uh, medical doctors, with uh, administrative staff, um, all walks uh, working in hospitals who very often 
unfortunately work in silos and we were working on uh, reorganizing things so that we may find more time for the patients and so we may have patient-based uh, health care. We want the patient to become a partner and not someone who is the object of medicine. And uh, this has led to very uh, tangible modifications. I won't go into the details. Uh, the, they may come up uh, during the Q&A. Now, obviously, we're reforming uh, daily practice of a big hospital, such as uh, HUG, with more than 1,000 beds, is uh, uh, quite ambitious. We don't know where this will lead us. We don't know whether we will be successful. But we firmly believe in our project, and this is why it is very important for us to be able to hear someone as experienced as you, Victoria Sweet, and uh, it is a great source of encouragement uh, to listen, to have the opportunity to listen to you. Thank you. Bonsoir tout le monde. Merci. Good evening to you all. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. I am going to be telling you what I mean by slow medicine. And anybody who wants to ask me questions and comments in French uh, can do so. I'd also especially like to thank Dr. Uh, Professor Anne Borofio for having, um, uh, I thought this was on. Yeah, that's, you're not hearing. How's this? Is this better? Ah, interesting. Hmm. Well, I'll start over again then. Um, I'll just say thank you very much for having me here, and thank you, Anne, for having uh, organized just such a wonderful uh, event this morning and this, this opportunity to talk about something that I'm really passionate about, and I think Dr. Perrier just explained very well what's going on and where I think we should be headed. What I'd like to do this evening, then, is to tell you how I came to this idea of slow medicine. Now, can everybody hear me? Back, we're back? Okay, good. I'm not the only doctor to come up with this idea, of course. There have been a number of other doctors who came up with this idea also, starting first in Italy, where it's an obvious extension of the slow food movement. But tonight I'll be telling you about my own version of slow medicine. I'll tell you a bit about myself, then about the unusual hospital where I practiced medicine for 20 years, and what I learned from its patients. And I'll end with the pilgrimage to Compostela and how it affected how I take care of my patients. The talk will be about 42 minutes, so we should have some time to discuss how we might go about implementing plus de temps pour les patients. The first thing you should know about me is that I don't think of myself as a natural-born doctor. When I was growing up, I never watched doctor shows on television. I didn't volunteer in hospitals. I wasn't interested in touching or even hearing about sick bodies. And when I told my parents I was going to medical school, they were absolutely shocked. What happened was that in my senior year of college, I got fascinated by the work of the psychiatrist, Carl Jung. I ran into his memoir, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, by accident in a bookstore, and I loved it. I particularly loved the way he'd set up his life living by a lake in Switzerland, seeing well-paying neurotic patients in the morning, and studying alchemy and illuminating manuscripts in the afternoon. I thought this was a wonderful way to live your life. And of course, this is the stone house he built for himself on the Lake of Zurich. And that's what I decided I wanted to be when I grew up, a Jungian psychiatrist. And that's how I got to medical school. But I ended up liking medical school a lot more than I thought I would. Especially like the last two years, uh, which are clinical years, at least in the States, which is when we finally got to examine our patients and learned how to do the workup. There was the history, which depended on how well I could listen to what a patient said and didn't say. There was the physical examination, and how I could figure out what was wrong with the patient, often, just by looking at and touching his body. There was deciding which labs and x-rays to get, and then putting everything together in the diagnosis, the treatment, and the plan. I thought it was a brilliant method. I still went into my psychiatric residency, however, but I found it disappointing. 
The hospital I was in had the only locked ward in our county. And the patients I saw there were not the cultured, articulate patients Jung had. They were severely psychotic. And the psychiatric medicines we gave them worked much better than any talk therapy I tried. So what I did is after I had my medical license after that first year of internship, I just quit my residency and went out and practiced medicine. I worked in a county clinic and whenever there was a war or a rumor of war, I saw patients with, from that part of the world. We had, we had a new wave of immigrants with a different culture and a different language. In that clinic, I saw just about all the parasites there are. I saw leprosy three times, and this was four miles from Stanford University. I saw many strange cancers and unusual diseases. Eventually, I decided I liked medicine, and I went back and did the three years of a uh, med medical residency in internal medicine. On the whole, I found that the longer I practiced medicine, the more impressed I was by its logical method for arriving at a diagnosis and a treatment. But I was also more and more impressed by what it left out, naturally, anything that wasn't logical. So after a while, I began looking around for a different, more inclusive model in alternative medicines, in naturopathy, in homeopathy, but especially in Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine. They were impressive systems. And for a while, I thought about learning Chinese or Sanskrit so I could really understand them. But finally, I decided even if I did learn the language, their cultures were just too different for mine. It was at this rather discouraging point in my life that one day, in the library, I discovered a book that surprised me. It was called Hildegard of Bingen's Medicine, and it had just been translated from Latin into German and German into English. In the introduction, I learned that Hildegard had been a 12th century German nun. She'd also been a mystic, a visionary, a composer, and a medical practitioner. And she'd written this book on her medicine, and as I read the book, I was more and more intrigued. Hildegard's medicine was not the eye of newt, toe of frog I'd expected from a medieval medical text. It was a real medicine for real patients with real diseases I could recognize. But it was clearly based on a completely different model of the body from my own modern Western model. I couldn't quite put my finger on how it was different. In some ways, it was a lot like Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine. And I wondered if it was perhaps the missing piece that had been left out of the Western medicine I'd been taught. So I decided at that moment to go back to school and get a PhD in medical history with Hildegard as my focus. But I didn't want to stop practicing medicine. And that's how I got to Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco because it was the only place at the time that I could find that would let me practice medicine part-time. When I saw it for the first time, high on a hill overlooking the ocean, I was taken aback. It looked like a 12th century Romanesque monastery with cream-colored walls, a red-tiled roof, a bell tower, and turrets. After my interview, the medical director took me out for the tour. Well, the place was huge. It was on 62 acres of land, so 10 hectares, right in the middle of San Francisco. And at the time, it had almost 1,200 patients. She showed me the long, open Florence Nightingale wards where the patients lived, the old-fashioned operating room, a 1950s-era beauty salon with its steel helmet hair dryers, and the chapel, which was more like a small church, really, with polished wooden pews, stained glass windows, and very politically incorrect stations of the cross along the walls. Then we went outside, and she showed me the greenhouse, the aviary, and the little barnyard so that patients could pot plants, watch chickens hatch from eggs, and even see animals, even if they were bed down. And then we walked back to her office, and she offered me the job. Well, I wasn't sure. The hospital looked like no hospital I had ever seen or even imagined. On the other hand, it was the only place that would let me practice medicine part-time. 
So I hedged my bets. I told her I would come for two months, and I ended up staying for 20 years. Because it turned out to be a great place to practice medicine. And the reason for that was that originally it had been the San Francisco almshouse, which was how in the States we used to take care of the sick poor before there was health insurance. It used to be that almost every county in the state had an almshouse, along with the county hospital. And both were more or less funky, but adequate and free, and they provided some place where anyone could go. What happened in the States is that starting in the 1950s, many of the county hospitals and almost all of the almshouses were closed for reasons of justice from the left and economy from the right. And Laguna Hondo was probably the last almshouse in the United States. Typically, the almshouse got the bottom ten, one tenth of 1% 1 of people. And so the patients I saw at Laguna Hondo were three standard deviations from the mean any mean. They were the tallest and the shortest. They were the oldest and the youngest. They were the fattest and the thinnest and the nicest and the meanest patients I ever had. And they had almost every disease too, because if a disease occurred in one in a hundred thousand, I would see a case. So I learned a tremendous amount of medicine there. And I soon learned that the most important thing to do when I first admitted a patient was to see him or her as soon as they arrived, before looking at the records or talking with the family. It wasn't how I'd been taught, but that way I could reach my own conclusions, uncontaminated by their previous diagnoses. So what I would do is that as soon as I got a new patient and my patient was in bed, I would walk down that old-fashioned ward, find him or her, and sit on his bed or in a chair, and then we would just look at one another for that first moment, which is the beginning of a long-term relationship. Everything that will ever come up is already there, if you only knew. I would see how clean or dirty my new patient was, how happy or sad, scared, fretful, or at peace. I would get an immediate sense of how sick he was, of how much life force I had to work with, which is the most important measure of all. We would talk but not much. We would talk later. I would examine the patient first. Because although today there is a movement to discredit or even ban the physical examination as not evidence-based, not objective, there is nothing better, nothing more informative than thoroughly examining a patient. Not as a ritual, not because it is traditional, not even in order to strengthen the doctor-patient relationship, but simply because the body is where the diagnoses are. The body is the problem. The body is what the patient brings us. Only after that if thorough examination would I go back to my little office and go through the records page by page. I always found discrepancies, discordant diagnoses, multiple medications for the same problem. Then I would talk with the family, call up the previous physicians, and try to establish the real diagnoses, which I would order from most important to least important. Finally, I would write up the story of the patient using the elegant format of modern medicine, history, physical, assessment, and plan. Day by day, I would work through this plan, reformulating it as things became clear. And although to a healthcare economist all that time would seem inefficient, I was continually impressed by how efficient it was, even from a healthcare economist's point of view. For example, patients would come in in that hospital on between 15 and 26 medications, of which they actually needed only four or five. They would have accreted all those medications over the years as their doctors, not having the time to discontinue a perhaps unnecessary medication in a stable patient would simply renew everything. They would have gathered diagnoses too, serious diagnoses they didn't actually have or had no longer, seizures, diabetes, hypertension, even cancer or AIDS, for which they were taking medications and getting lab tests that they didn't need. 
Establishing the correct diagnoses and then getting them off all those unnecessary medications with all their side effects took me a lot of time. But in the long run, it saved way more money than it cost. It was slower, but it was better. Plus de temps pour les patients meant that I had the time to get it right, which to my mind seems simply this, that the patient is happy, the doctor is happy, we have the right diagnosis and the right treatment, all for the least amount of money. This is what I call the efficiency of inefficiency, and it is amazingly cost effective. Meanwhile, I'd gone back to school and started my PhD in medical history with Hildegard of Bingen as my focus. I wanted to understand what was so different about her medicine and the pre-modern medicine she represented. My idea was to look at Hildegard and her medicine from the inside by learning her language, her culture, and her history as she knew it. So I studied medieval Latin and German, paleography, medieval history, and medical history, and I took classes in medical anthropology and folklore. And I read what she wrote in her own medieval Latin in their original manuscripts, and I studied every 12th century medical manuscript I could find. Also, I experimented. I grew her medicinal plants in my garden. I cooked up her potions and syrups. I brewed her medicinal uh, beers and I baked her antidepressant cookies. And slowly, I began to understand how Hildegard's model of the body differed from our own modern mechanical model of the body. Our modern idea of the body is that the body is fundamentally a machine. Or as you can see in this wonderful image by Fritz Kahn from the 1920s, a collection of machines. The brain is a computer. The heart is a pump. The kidney is a filtering device. Disease, therefore, is a mechanical breakdown. And the role of the doctor is to find what is broken and fix it, repair it, or replace it. Hildegard's idea of the body, I gradually realized, was very different. Her idea was that the body was more like a plant than a machine, and the doctor more like a gardener than a mechanic. What's the difference? The difference is that someone else has to fix a broken machine, but a plant can heal itself. Hildegard called the power of a plant to heal itself its viriditas, its greening power from the Latin viridis, which means green. And she assumed that the body, just like a plant, had its own viriditas, its own greening power, and that the job of the doctor was to nourish it and remove obstructions to it, just like a gardener does. But I didn't really understand what she really meant until one particular patient I called Terry Becker. Terry was homeless and lived on the streets with her boyfriend, Mike. And they smoked and drank and took drugs. And then one day, she woke up paralyzed from the neck down. So since the city of San Francisco still had its county, old-fashioned county system, she and Mike went over to the county hospital. She was admitted, and with the miracles of modern medicine, they quickly, in three days, diagnosed what she had, which was transverse myelitis, which is a rare viral disease that has no treatment, but usually gets better on its own. So the hot docs sent her over to Laguna Honda for rest and recuperation, and I happened to become her doctor. And she did get better. Pretty quickly, she began to move her shoulders and be able to light her own cigarettes. Then the first of the month rolled around, which is when in San Francisco, the homeless get wealth, their welfare cash from City Hall just by showing up. And Mike showed up with alcohol and drugs, and Terry left with him to get their welfare cash, and she never came back. She disappeared for about a year. Later, I found out that during that year, she turned up the ER 28 times. And one time, Mike took a two by four to her, broke her leg, robbed her, and abandoned her on the streets of San Francisco. Eventually, she developed a huge bed sore from sitting in her wheelchair all day long. 
And the surgeons at the county hospital operated on it three different times so that they could cover it with a skin graft. But every time as she was starting to heal, the first of the month would roll around, Mike would show up, Terry would go out with him, and that graft would deteriorate. Finally, that bed sore was just too big to graft. The surgeons at the general threw up their hands and sent her back to Laguna Honda. And once again, I just happened to be her doc when she came in. When I saw Terry's bed sore for the first time, I have to tell you I was absolutely shocked. It was the largest opening in a body I'd ever seen. It went from the middle of her back down to her coccyx. It spanned both her sit bones, sit bones and it was so deep that at the bottom of it, there was all this decayed and decaying tissue from his skin grafts, but I could see at the bottom of it, I could actually see bone, Terry's spine. It was way too big to graft. The surgeons were right, and it would have to heal on its own. <clears throat> and in the meantime, what chance did Terry have of not getting an infection that would kill her? It wouldn't work in those cases for me to give antibiotics prophylactically, and I had nothing left in my little black bag. So I walked back to my office, and I sat down at my desk, and I thought about this. I thought how Terry Becker would probably die uh, in a modern era of a medieval disease. I found myself staring at a plant that a patient had given me years before, that by this time had grown all across my wall. And I thought this bed sore was a catastrophe, possibly the end of Terry Becker. But then suddenly I asked myself, well, what would Hildegard do? I thought about Veriditas and the idea that coursing through Terry's body was this natural power of life and healing. And I thought, maybe Hildegard wouldn't do anything at all, except remove what was in Veriditas's way. Well, what was in its way, I asked myself. All that dead tissue was in its way and had to be removed. Anything uncomfortable that attracted Terry's attention like wrinkled bedclothes or hard mattress had to be removed. Any medications she didn't absolutely need. Uncertainty, fear, hopelessness. And then, what Hildegard would do, I thought, would be to strengthen Terry's Veriditas with the basics. Good food, deep sleep, fresh air, and sunlight. So I wrote my prescriptions. And it was amazing to see how fast Hildegard's prescription began to work. But then the first of the month rolled around, and right on schedule, Mike showed up. He was still pretty cute, still wearing his tight Levi's, still walking with his little strut. The nurses made him wait in the waiting room, and we all watched as Terry rolled herself on her prone gurney down the ward and went into the waiting room to meet him. They were in there a long time. Finally, the door opened, and Mike came out and left. Terry had thrown him out. She told him never to come back. Then she stopped smoking, and her appetite improved, and that hole in her backside began to fill in. Since I only checked it once a week, its progress seemed as magical as those time-lapse movies that they used to show us in school, where you see a plant grow from a seed in a few minutes. First, the base of it began to glisten, and then I saw muscle appear, and then fat, and then subcutaneous tissue, and all around there was skin crawling in from the sides, so that that hole became shallower and shallower and smaller and smaller, until finally it looked just like a huge scab on Terry's back. And then the scab started to flake off, and there was new, perfect Terry Becker skin underneath. It took a long time. It took two and a half years. But we were in no hurry, and neither was she. And at the end of those years, the social worker found her family in the Midwest who wanted her to live with them, and the hospital bought her a plane ticket and flew her out, and there she stayed and did not go back on the streets and lived for many years. Terry changed the way I practice medicine. After Terry, I began to look at my patient not only with the eye of a modern doctor, asking myself what's wrong and how can I fix it. I also would step back and look at my patient in the context of his environment and ask myself, 
What can I do to remove what's in the way of viriditas? And what can I do to strengthen it? What I found with my patients at Laguna Honda was that both ways, the way of the mechanic and the way of the gardener, work well when applied to the right patient at the right time. And when I tried to conceptualize for myself what was the difference, I realized that they're different and equally useful in the same way that fast food and slow food are different and equally useful. And that's how I started calling it what I did, slow medicine, like slow food, as opposed to fast medicine. And it works best on patients who have slow diseases, chronic diseases, slow in coming on, or diseases for which modern medicine has no treatment as opposed to the fast medicine I also use, which works so well when a patient has appendicitis, or heart attack, or even cancer, but which doesn't work so well when the patient's recovering from the appendectomy, the heart attack, or the chemotherapy. And although it's easy to put slow medicine and fast medicine in opposition, as I've just done, actually I find they work best together the same way that our two eyes give us two different perspectives, which when merged together gives us a three-dimensional view of the patient. Well, by this time, I had finished my PhD on Hildegard, and as a present to myself for finishing, I decided to walk the medieval pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in Spain, 2,000 kilometers across France and Spain. But what's a pilgrimage, and why did I want to go on one? A pilgrimage is a journey for spiritual reasons, but with a material goal, a shrine, a church, a mountain. The word comes from the Latin word for pilgrim, peregrinus, from per agar, which means through the territory. So a pilgrim is someone who leaves home to travel through a territory that is, by definition, not home. And so it means alien, foreigner, stranger. In the Middle Ages, being a pilgrim was a big deal. It was what we all are, the medievals thought, pilgrims on the pilgrimage of life, leaving our home at birth and traveling through time until we reach the spiritual goal of death. Along the way, feeling other to what we see around us. And to make a physical pilgrimage was to make that metaphor real. There were three major pilgrimages in the Middle Ages. There was the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to Rome, and to Santiago de Compostela, which was the most exotic. It became a pilgrimage site in the ninth century when the body of St. James was discovered at the northern tip of Spain. The miraculous story was that the body had arrived in a stone boat that set sail from Jerusalem when the saint was martyred. After it was discovered, a cathedral was built so that pilgrims had some place to stay at night as they walked. It became very popular, and by the 12th century, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims were walking to Compostela every year to see and hug this reliquary of St. James Bones. After the Middle Ages, though, with the Reformation, it was pretty much forgotten until the 1980s when it was discovered. And when I heard it was still possible to walk it in the medieval way on the medieval paths, I decided to do it. I started looking around for a friend to go with me which was harder than I thought. But eventually my friend from medical school, Rosalind, said she would go. The whole thing takes two months, and since we were both working, we decided to divide it into four sections and do it over four years. We wouldn't take backpacks, but we took little day packs. We walked about 25 kilometers every day and stayed in chambre d'hôtes or little one-star hotels. And over the next four years, that is what we did. We would go in early September, which is a beautiful time in France and Spain, and there were just enough pilgrims on the way to make it interesting and companionable. Every year we would go back with the same packs to exactly where our footsteps stopped the year before. We would put on our last year's clothes, lift up our walking sticks, and take the next step. And every year, as soon as I heard the click of my stick on the cobblestones, I would be right back in that space of pilgrimage right back where I'd been a year before, as if only a night had passed. Every year I learned something different, something special, that I took back to my life, to the hospital, and to my patients, and which changed the way I practice medicine. 
I'm going to tell you about the third year and what I took back to my patients from it. The third section leaves from saint jean pied de port in France, goes over the Pyrenees to Roncesvalles in Spain, and then continues halfway across Spain. So it goes through France, the Basque Country, and Castile. Four languages and many different foods and ecosystems with lots of history. What I took back to the hospital that third year was the day we got ahead of our group. I call it our group, but we didn't have a formal group. Rosalind and I traveled as the two of us. But informal groups formed, just as they did for Chaucer at the Inn of the Canterbury Tales. Because starting out from the same place every day, most people walk about the same distance, a kilometer every 15 minutes, or about two miles an hour. Some walk quickly, arrive at their destination early, and take a siesta and have a beer. Others take their time, though they still arrive at the same destination by the end of the day. So groups naturally form. The two Americans, the French singers, the flirtatious divorcee, the talkative Spaniard, the two serious Germans. But that particular day, we somehow got ahead of our group, a whole day ahead, though we didn't know it. That evening, we went out for dinner, sat down at a table, and ordered. And as we waited for our meal, I noticed that right next to us, at the next table, were two other Americans, pilgrims, just about our age. They even looked kind of like us. Then I sat back in my chair and I looked around. Sure enough, over there were the two somber German pilgrims, except they were not our serious German pilgrims. There was the French singing group, but they were Belgian, and they didn't sing but played the recorder. Way in the back was a doer Norwegian taking the place of our friendly Dane and the little group of Spaniards talking loudly, not ju just not our Spaniards. It was uncanny. It was a whole group of pilgrims traveling together, just like our group of pilgrims, but not our group of pilgrims. All the time I thought we were unique, walking on the pilgrim path, I thought it was our pilgrim path, opening its adventures for the first time to us. But ahead of us all the time was a near identical group, and doubtless behind us too. For lo and behold, there they, that is we were, in the restaurant that night, a version of ourselves and our group. That is what I brought back to the hospital that year. I'd already begun to realize something like it already. On the admitting ward, there was a way in which my patients were almost, if not quite, interchangeable. I always had a kind of group. But after the third year of the pilgrimage, I began to see that it was also true about the nurses and the doctors and everyone else at the hospital. My group, individual as each of its members were, were not unique. My patients and I, and the doctors and nurses and administrators, were just as accidental a group as a group of pilgrims on their way. It meant that the parts we were playing were, in some sense, accidental, as if this time I'll be the doctor and you'll be the patient. Next time we'll switch. And so after that third section of the pilgrimage, I began to look much more closely into the faces and eyes of my patients and the nurses and the bus drivers. Which part were they playing, I wondered. And I found they were looking back at me in the same searching, intimate way. And this brings me to the last part of my talk today, which is what happened to Laguna Honda and its old-fashioned style when it was finally discovered over the hill to the poorhouse. Because eventually it was discovered by the healthcare efficiency experts, by the lawyers of the Department of Justice, and no one liked what they saw. They the greenhouse, the aviary, the barnyard, but especially the big open wards. Nobody liked those at all. And so they demanded that San Francisco shut down the old hospital and build a new modern healthcare and rehabilitation facility or shut it down. There were a lot of battles in politics, letters to the newspapers, meetings and protests, hiring and firings. And I took some time off to think about what I'd learned over those 20 years there and think about what I'd seen about medicine. Looking back, it seems to me that in my life as a doctor, what I've seen in the past 25 years is that the healthcare pendulum has swung from the personal towards the efficient. And I have been more and more impressed by just how inefficient that efficiency is. In spite of everything the economists have tried, healthcare keeps rising every year. 
There are a lot of ideas about why healthcare costs keep rising, although no one really knows for sure. So I want to end by showing you what I do know for sure, which is what happened at Laguna Honda in the 20 years I practiced medicine there. During those 20 years, as a cost-cutting measure, the number of patients we took care of was cut by a third, so from 1,178 to 780. Correspondingly, the number of doctors was cut from 32 to 9. And the clinical staff, it's better here, the clinical staff also was cut from 1,500 to 1,200. And yet, despite all these cuts, our budget rose every year. What accounted for that? The number of administrative staff. Because even though, as you can see, the patients were cut, the doctors were cut, the staff was cut, the total staff I found out when I looked into it rather carefully stayed about the same. There were more and more administrators every year. And what did all those administrators do? Well, it was hard to know for sure. But the one thing we had more of at Laguna Honda on the day I left than the day I started were forms. When I first got there, there were two single-page forms in our chart. The day before I left, as a, as a memoir, I took out one of our old paper charts, and I went through it and I counted randomly how many forms was in that particular chart. There were 43 forms, and none of them were single pages. There were three-page forms, five-page forms, 20-page forms. There were so many forms that the charts would explode from the forms, and the medical record staff would have to come and thin the charts, taking out the doctor's notes to make room for the forms. This is the, um, in order to understand what I'd been seeing, this is the, the uh, thing I put together at the time. As you can see here, I think this gives you an idea, here are the patients going down and the docs going down and the clinical staff staying about the same, the budget going up, and here are the number of forms. And as you can see, if, if the same process continues, in 2024, the number of patients at Laguna Honda will hit zero. <laughs> there'll be two docs. There'll be a staff of 1,400. There'll be a budget of $275 million and an infinite number of forms. I call this doing less with more. And it's uh, the same exact thing is happening uh, in the United States in general and I believe around the world. As you can see from this um, graph. This is the growth of physicians and administrators in the United States. As you can see from 1970 to 2009, the number of docs about doubled along with the population. This is the budget, and this is the number of administrators. It's about 13 times. Correspondingly, just like at Laguna Honda, the number of paperwork, this is just the, number, the paperwork in the 10 years at, uh, has doubled from 300 million hours to 600, almost 700 million hours. And just as at Laguna Honda, the budget has completely gone, uh, continued to go up. And the same thing is happening most everywhere in the world. And the question is, in the interest of so-called efficiency, there's a big push going on now for all the efficiencies we've done in America to spread. Electronic health records, HMOs, teams, lean, the virtual instead of the personal. With the same results to be expected, here in Switzerland as in the US, doctors will end up spending all their time and even more than all their time on the computer with no one to look at their patients, no time to look at their patients, examine their patients, think about their patients, and get the right diagnosis and the right treatments. And this is not only bad for the patient and the doctors, but it is also expensive. So the question then becomes, can we prove that what I'm calling slow medicine is actually more efficient than efficient fast medicine? We can, and I believe uh, that is something that we can speak about now that um, I'm almost done <laughs> with my talk, uh, because there are two new studies that look at uh, these two different ways of taking care of patients. Uh, the fast way, which turns out to be costly, and the slow way, which turns out to be most efficient. So uh, with that, uh, I want to end with pointing out that uh, having enough time with our patients is like this puzzle 
when we have enough free time, we have a place to move, we have a place to, to do that extra step, to find out, to, to make the extra gesture. Without that, we become uh, docs and healthcare workers on an assembly line. Uh, for more, you can take a look at my book, uh, Slow Medicine. And with that, I will end us by reminding us of the idea of who, in the end, wins that race. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria, for this very important talk. I think you are raising very important things. Thank you. Je retourne au français parce que Victoria. Uh, let me move back to French because Victoria understands French. This way, we can have a, a Q and A session. You may ask your question either in French or in English, but she will most certainly reply in English for those of you who are following via interpretation. We have microphones that will go round the room with our students, so please raise your hand if you have a question. Quelqu'un derrière, s'il vous plaît. Someone at the back. Merci, Thank you very much. I am really impressed to see that in the US, maybe you are more intelligent than us, you actually um, studied Hildegard von Bingen, who um, even um, opposed the, the Pope. And I find it quite extraordinary that you were able to persuade your colleagues. What happened to your hospital where you were so happy? And what happened with the new hospital they built? And uh, what is going on in San Francisco? Alors, je vais essayer un peu de... So I will try and reply in French. But I may switch back to, to English later on. So what, what happened? A, a new facility, a brand new facility w w was built, a, a healthcare facility uh, was built. Uh, all the patients have private rooms. Um, and most of the people who stayed in, had experienced the old hospital really regret uh, the loss of that open, free space. Um, but the hospital did move, the, all the patients moved, and it's been now about uh, eight years. Uh, and it's, it's fighting the same battle that's going across the United States and probably the world, the battle of the computer taking over uh, everything. Um, I, I think on the whole, uh, it's, it's the same kind of place because the patients are the same, but the, if I understood his question, that's right. It, it's, but there's a push for efficiency, there's a push to discharge the patients. I mean, it's much more like a, a new hospital without this space. One of, the, one of the things about those open wards is that we could take patients in. We could just always find a place. We could, there would be a door we could open and, and put a patient in there. With the single ho hospital rooms, it's very strict. We have to get patients out. We have to discharge them so that most of the energy on is to get the patient out, which is, I think, what's happening. I don't know here in Switzerland, but certainly in the United States. Is that, was that pretty much? Also, yeah. Uh, is, is it the same uh, everywhere in the States, or is it special here? But there was this kind of hospital yes. as well. The, as far as I could tell, the, it was the only hospital in the United States. And I've had a chance to go all over the United States. Uh, there were a couple of other places that also got closed down around the same time. So I don't think there's anything left like that in the United States at all, which is really too bad, I think. Anyway. Yes. I'm a professor in ça marche? Ouais. I'm a professor in marketing, but I work on operations and marketing and quality of life. And I work on cancer patients and cancer caregivers and their quality of life. Yes. My first question 
in the leaflet, in the synthesis, introductory synthesis, they say something wrong. You said you were interested in, in the approach which is not logical. I mm. think actually this approach is very logical. Uh -huh. It's just a different frame, framework. That's what mm -hmm. we study in science. Mm -hmm. And very often we attack alternative medicines, saying it's not scientific. And I always try to explain to my PhD students in medicine, it's not not scientific, it's just a framework you don't understand. So my first question was this, could you comment a little bit more about the gap between the, the framework you are taught in the university yes. and the antique framework which yes. you studied with Bingen or with the Ayurvedic medicine. Mm -hmm. And second, uh, talk, to, talk to us a little bit more about the interaction between quality of life. I am convinced that by listening and talking more, we can improve the role of the patient as an actor. Mm -hmm. You commented that. And mm -hmm. that's very interesting for me, how to make him become an actor and therefore create a dynamic mm -hmm. where nurses, doctors and caregivers that's, that's my second question. Can you comment that? Okay. Thanks. So I guess the first, when I said not lo logical, um, I think of logic as being step by step. And one of the things that strikes me about the body is that it's, I think what the Italians would call complex, that it, it's not, the, the essence of a machine is that mostly one part does one thing. But what's fascinating about the body is that one part of our body does all kinds of things. One, one hormone does many different things. And when we, if we treat the body like a machine and change one thing, we're never just changing one thing. So when we give a medicine to somebody that we think, let's say, to lower their blood pressure, it also makes hair grow on their heads and makes their prostate shrink and does good things and bad things. We never just do one thing. And logical step by step in that way, I think, we consider the body as complex in the sense that meaning and health emerges out of it, not in this linear way. And one of the problems with when science, and I was a mathematician in, in college, it's not that I dislike logic, but I don't think that the body is accessible to understanding it as a whole if we try and break it down into its parts. We can understand a little bit, but we can't see it as a whole. So one of the intriguing things about this pre-modern way of looking at it as a plant is that you kind of, it's a, just a different way, you know, when I, when I look, and I use both. So when I look at a patient who brings me something, I first use this sort of focus in what's wrong here. But I also, there's a way in which I step back eh? and, and sort of see the patient as a whole with things going in, coming out of the patient. So in that sense, I see them as two different views, really. So that would be my answer to the first question. And the second is the, the issue of the patient being part of his or her healing, I think is, was the second part of your um, question. Um, I draw a big distinction between patients when they're acutely ill, vulnerable, scared, terrified, sick, and in pain, and the patients before that and after that. I know for myself, when I'm suffering, I don't personally think that I'm capable of making good decisions. I, I actually need, I need to be taken care of. Before that and after that, it's different though. So if after the, the surgery and this, this, how does the patient then gain back control? Um, I mean, I think that's natural for people to do it. It's almost a sign of healing to me that when a patient starts, starts to take an interest and say, okay, now what can I do? And of course, there's many things that a patient can do in the same way by asking him or herself, well, what's in the way of me feeling good? Because I, I think this in the way thing, I've, I've, I've gotten really interested in it as a, as a way, because it, it sort of accepts that our natural state is to feel well. Our natural state is to be happy. And if we're not, to ask what's in the way of that. I just find it a useful way to think. You're welcome. Oui, merci. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very informative presentation. I'm thinking about the future, the future of mankind. Don't you think 
that we could uh, include uh, uh, in the uh, various uh, school uh, curricula uh, modules uh, for pupils, for students, to, 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 to learn more about themselves, to get to know themselves. Since we're all different, it's, there's no point in going to see a doctor who doesn't know us and who would then have to give a diagnostic um, because that doctor doesn't know us and we are all different. So it would be a good thing to learn about yourself first, to, 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 to try and understand how you react to um, um, weather conditions, etc learn to the people when they are young already still at school to better know themselves ah. well so the way i would answer that okay that's what i so so again i actually think it's natural to let's go look at what is in the way of, of students doing that because my experience of uh young people is that they're fantastic that they're searching that they're naturally that they're naturally curious interested you know cool kind of people What's in the way of them flourishing? What's in the way of them doing that? And I think it's pretty clear what's in the way these days, right? I mean, you can't, you can't do much when you're walking around like this. So part of what I think of as, as slow is making space, like the little puzzle I showed you. So when I tell my students, I think it's, I try and do, I actually don't, for instance, think, uh, no. I, try, I try to convince my students that uh, multitasking, do you have that in, in French? Multitasking is impossible. The mind does not multitask. The mind only does one thing. Now, it may do one thing in fragments. It may listen to music and, and then do something here and then do something here, but you can only do either zero things or one thing. And I think that it's really useful for the young especially to think about doing nothing. They don't do enough nothing, at least in the United States. Um, and I'm into uh, this concept of taking a vacation every day. Now I'm going to say something heretical, okay? This is heretical. But uh, there's a way in which uh, I regret the loss of smoking. Now, I was never a smoker, so it's easy for me to say. But what smoking, if you think about it, did was give people who smoked 20 or 30 times a day where they took a vacation. I mean, if you go back to the 50s and the 60s, people would just take their cigarettes and they stopped doing what they were doing. They would light up, they'd chit chat 30 times a day. And I think one of the things that happened when we've, we've lost this kind of space, this sense that it's a good thing to not listen to music, not do two things at once, or even one thing at once, to do zero. And I point out to my students that the word vacation is related to the word vacuum is related to the word vacate and vacant. It means to make space. And for myself personally, it's when I've made space that something new comes in to fill up space up and not something old. So what I try to convince the students back to is, is not to teach them something else, but to let them clear some space in their life for there's something else to come to them. There is a question. Hi, hello. Uh, Thank you for your brilliant talk. Uh, I'm an intern here in internal medicine. I'm here. Oh, there you are. Uh, my, so one of the aphorisms of Sir William Moslem was listen to the patient will whisper you the diagnosis. However, uh, the patient has become an icon in a computer yes. right now. And my question is, computers are here, technology or new technologies have their pluses. What is, in your opinion, how can we put them at service of slow medicine? Could you say that again? I quite... So, how can, we use technology, How can we computers, use technology, uh, electronic health records, yes. and to put them at service of uh, the concept of slow medicine? Well, at the moment, again, back to removing what's in the way, the way the electronic health records are actually constructed are way in the way of us getting at what we need to get at. So I think we could start with reconstructing the electronic health records. I think the electronic health records could, could be helpful if they did, if they had all the value of paper records. The value of paper records was that by writing my patient's story, I had to think about the story, I had to actually think and synthesize and come up with the story of the patient. That was useful, and electronic health records as they stand now have, have destroyed that possibility. 
So I think they need to be fixed. I think if they were fixed, what would be useful about them. The horrible thing with paper records was that the patient would be in the hospital, I could never tell what had happened. If, they'd patient, if my patient in America would come to France and something, had no way. So this interoperability that electronic provides would be wonderful. I'm not a believer in thinking that uh, computers can, can even begin to approach human intelligence when, it's, when it has the space to think. So that's what, I, I think the electronic health records need to be fixed. Is that, is that sort of, okay. Voilà, merci beaucoup. C'est vrai que c'était agréable. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very pleasant moment, like a stroll through a garden, through a yard, and thank you very much. There is an issue that we never take up, and I'd like to thank uh, the medical doctors who've organized this event. We never talk about the fact that medical science is a fallacy for the most part. It is erroneous for epistemological reasons. Uh, the uh, editors of, in chief of uh, most periodicals uh, say so. The University of Oxford says so. It says that we cannot go forward with the uh, studies uh, that are erroneous. There is a crisis of uh, reproduction of repeat you try repeating studies and when you do nine times out of ten you cannot repeat the results of a study and this obviously challenges uh, uh, the integrity not of the doctors per se but we've got a huge epistemological problem in the system no everybody turns a blind eye to it no one wants to take it into consideration no one wants to see its magnitude and there's also the denial of the human uh, in first year in medical faculty i'm amazed that in 2018 medical students still have to do that obviously you need to select the best students, but doing so through this hard exam, it's inhuman. I don't know how, you, how anyone can stand for such a system. At the moment, 50% of all postdoctoral post students are borderline burnt out. So, so we're evolving within a system that's inhuman, that does not take into account the human factor and that are epistemologically erroneous. Uh, it's not ideology, it's science here. And I'm saying we've got a huge problem. So that was a comment on your part rather than a question, right? You want Victoria to react to that? It was, okay, not so well. Uh, the argument is that we, uh, the, 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 the medicine today is based on evidence that is not, a, not, not correct. Uh -huh. That the studies are not reproducible, that the science is not okay, that uh, gets us the evidence of, to practice medicine. So that was one of the... On the do you want to comment? Maybe it's I, don't, I don't really know how to, how to comment really to that. I mean, I think... It's certainly true that, uh, that, you know, there's a lot of irreproducibility, there's a lot of profit motive. I mean, I think, honestly, the thing that disturbs me most in the actual practice of medicine, let's say today, has been, at least in the United States, the influence of the profit motive on, on the actual um, uh, studies. So that, you know, I read them carefully, uh, I, I, my favorite part of a study is to read the placebo group because the placebo group is the group that didn't get anything and about 30 to 50 percent of the time they do equally well. And so what's happened in the United States is the drug companies are now have uh, asked, uh, decided it's too difficult to have a placebo group and they want to not have a placebo group for obvious reasons because they can say that their new drug works 50% of the time. So I'm, I'm very disturbed by that piece. I think as part of our knowledge of the body and the reproducibility and irreproducibility of it, you know, we're never, I, I think compared to 150 years ago, it's amazing what we know. It is amazing what we know. And when I say no, what I mean is, the truth, we, in English we say the truth of the pudding is in the eating. So what that means is, you know, when I give a patient a medicine and their cancer goes away, that's pretty fabulous. It's pretty fabulous even from when I started as a medical student. So I think we're not going to hit perfection. Uh, I'm disturbed about the drug company's influence. I'm disturbed about the marketing piece. But I think the essential scientific part is, 
is a better way to go than in Hildegard's time where it was purely, everybody had their own little potions and tried this and that. We, it, it's really hard to progress when you have that kind of individual stuff. So that's what I would say. Okay. Dr. Sweet, thank you very much for the conference, which was very interesting. My uh, question is related you know, to efficiency. As you said, um, we, we have to do more with less, and uh, you talk about the forms to be filled. Yes. And uh, with these forms, you know, we need more uh, documentation, we need more records, we need proof. And uh, in that way, my question is, uh, when you try to get more time uh, for, uh, you know, patients, have you been able to uh, review the forms and maybe to reduce the number of pages to be filled or uh, to, to review the efficiency of the forms? The whole issue of forms is really very loaded and it's sort of a, a long discussion. Um, I think the forms, the protocols, the paradigms uh, are not about taking care of the patient. They're actually about something really very different. They're about getting information. They're about um, selling information to the pharmaceutical companies. They're about providing things to the government. It's, it's not really helpful to a patient at all for me to fill a form out. It's useless. Um, so, and, and that's just the way it's, that's just the way it's headed. So, you know, I, uh, in a sort of joking way, I've thought we could pass a law for the conservation of forms that right now we could decide, you know what, we have enough forms to last the rest of our existence in our hospital. Okay? We're not, we're not going to have any more forms. If an administrator comes up with a new form, they have to find an old form of equal length to get rid of before they can have a new form. And because I think it's a crisis proportion, I think for the beginning few years, they should find two forms. I mean, we could start just getting rid of forms. If you have a new form, then get rid of two or four, three forms so have a, a steady state of forms. I also think that there's a, there's a concept that I like, call, I call slow administration. Because I, for any administrators here, I really don't want to set the administrators up as the enemy. I mean, administrators are just responding to the laws and everything that they have to do. But I do think that uh, administrators could also practice slow administration. And what I mean by that is to acknowledge that every time they do, send us a new paradigm, a new program, a new email, a new this. It's taking time from our patient. And if they respected that and helped us, helped us remove what is in our way, I think we'd get a lot of, I think the administrators would feel better about themselves. So I, I think it's like a different point of view. Hmm? Okay, thanks. Donc je crois qu'on va, on va s'arrêter là. I think that's it for tonight. Uh, I would like to thank Victoria and thank you all for your participation.